welcome to the Fast Cat Podcast. I'm Frank Overton, and the Fast Cat coaches and I are here to take your training to the next level. And I'm Ben Delaney, and in each episode, we'll share our combined 75 years of experience from coaching Tour de France pros to Master Janes and Joes. At Fast Cat, we're on a mission to share our knowledge to help you ride faster and have more fun while training. If you listen closely, you should be able to feel yourself getting faster. What's up, Fast Cat Nation? Big Cat here, along with Ben Delaney. Hello, hello. Today we are talking weightlifting for cycling. We are deep into our eight pod series of how to train from the fall through to early spring. We've been having the greatest hits of sorts of topics Fast Cat's been educating you folks about for many years. We started off with end of summer training with Coach Frank. We did a season review, how to review your season with Coach Christian, how to set your goals for next year with Coach Jake. We did a postseason break with Coach Ricky. We did off-season training with Coach Frank. We did just last week cross-training and MTIs with Coach Isaiah, and now we are number seven weightlifting for cycling. We're not talking about Hans and Franz here. We're not getting we're not getting huge, not getting swole. We're trying to help you produce more power on the bike. That's the aim of the game. That's the name of the game here for today's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We are talking about the kind of weightlifting that increases your power output namely your threshold. It'll also increase your one minute and 30 second and sprint power, five minute power. This is, this is the cycling specific uh, type of weightlifting that we're talking about. Longtime loyal listeners will recognize this is, they've heard it all before, but we talk about this at the same time every year because resistance training works. And we've been coaching cyclists through this, uh, f- this style of weightlifting um, for 20 years now. And it's a, uh, it's a 10 week program. It's four phases. It's cycling specific and it works. Last podcast, we talked about MTI's muscle tension intervals as a way to help translate those power gains from the gym onto the bike. I was joking with you a couple podcasts ago about how I was inadvertently doing some MTIs thanks to a, <laughs> a dead battery. And we're also reminiscing about, you know, fixed gear training is, is something done back in the day that, you know, we can now get those benefits with the bike you already have. You don't need to go out and get a whole other bike. Sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Although you, you still have your, you still got your Bianchi Pista, yeah? I do. I have a Bianchi Pista. Yeah. I bought from U-Bikes for $400 in 2003 after a pro cyclist told me that was what you did in the fall. He said, ride your fixed gear, I don't know, a thousand kilometers. And uh, I took him to heart and I... Went out and bought the bike, and, and I tried it. I did not like the fixed gear on open roads. And I quickly f- flipped the wheel to the free hub, and I also took it to the bike shop and got a brake put on. Yeah. It was greatly enhanced after that. Yeah, fixies with no brakes look cool, but yeah. uh, getting your face mushed into a truck doesn't look quite so cool. Yeah, but I did do quite a bit of fixed gear training back in the day. Yeah. Remember my, our man Neil Rogers coming down 19th, which is a steep hill here yes. on up on his Bianchi. Yes, and the RPM is getting over a point that he could handle. So his response was to take his feet off and just <laughs> brrr, you know just mixing bowl down straight through the intersection. Luckily, yeah. he did not die. Yeah. Well, I've seen. Have you? I'm sure you've seen the cool kids do it. The uh, I'm just pointing you towards the mic there. Keep talking to the mic. The the. Uh, the cool kids that uh, will do the, they lift their wheel up and then they do the skids. Yeah, it's incredible what yeah. uh, a talented track rider can do. The state bicycle has got that riding fixies uphill with pros mm-hmm. YouTube series. That's a that's an entertaining one yeah. to watch. One for the conversation, then two to watch him rip it downhill. Mm-hmm. Of yeah, spinning it like who knows what one fifty RPM, and then also like breaking. By yeah, hopping up and then locking yeah. up the rear wheel and hopping and locking. At speed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not really going to talk about <laughs> fixed gear <laughs> cycling anymore. Uh, but that was a little trip down memory lane. Uh, but yeah, we are going to talk about weightlifting for cycling in 
and in, in, in what we're going to talk about the how you do it, our philosophy behind resistance training for cyclists, and then we'll actually describe out what that entails on a four phase week by week, day by day basis. So if you take notes, you probably could, yeah, design your own cycling for, you know, 10 week cycling resistance training plan, or you could just subscribe to optimize and use the, the 10 week cycling plan that we have there. Lots of different ways to do it. You can, yeah. you can do it the easy way, follow the, follow the plan. That's what FTFP is. Mm-hmm. Frank and the coaches have put together many plans with a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears that work. You can just follow those plans. Oh, yeah. Or you can put yours together and we're here with the podcast to, to help you. However, you're trying to, to go about it. We're going to be talking about, you know, how sprinters can benefit from doing weightlifting, time trials, cross racers, triathletes, mountain bikers, road racers. You know, there's lots of, lots of different groups of folks that can benefit from this. Masters athletes, we know you are a large portion of our audience. We are you, you are us. (laughs) Yes. We Um, need to lift weights. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And why? So we'll get into all that first. As per podcast tradition, we've got some announcements for you folks. Yeah. Uh, let me re, re, bleh, let me read the review of the week, and uh, then we'll get into our announcements. Great. Uh, this one comes to us. Uh, he says, faster, and the app is improving every month. I signed up for Optimize, mostly for the included coaching and access to training plans. That part has been phenomenal and well worth it. The app itself is good and getting better with new features. Integrating sleep metrics into training is helpful today. Looking forward to see what new features they launch around customizing individual workouts and seeing future fitness based on planned workouts. Well, I thank you for that review. And, I, you know, since you mentioned it, uh, I would be remiss not to give you an update uh, with Optimize. We have billed 187 coming out, I think, maybe. Um, Let me look at my phone here while you're talking. I think you're on 185, <laughs> and uh, that came out with uh, the landscape mode, so you could get a better look at your weekly training literally by just turning your phone sideways. That gave you more real estate to look at that view. That was a pretty sweet feature. Um, what we're working on right now is uh, a new and improved uh, Garmin um, data upload, so look for faster and more efficient uploads from your Garmin device if you're on a Garmin. Um, We do have push to Garmin and Hammerhead, just to give you an update, and we are working on the push to Wahoo. One thing I learned three days ago is that Wahoo does not have a public API. And uh, so I reached out to their CTO, and he got back to me, and they're working on it, and as soon as they finish it, we will send your workouts to your Wahoo. <laughs> and uh, while we're on that subject, you didn't expect to know much about software development from this podcast today, but, <laughs> but here you go. Here's another one. Uh, Zwift does not have a public API, and uh, I reached out to their CEO, uh, both of them, in a matter of fact, and they are, in fact, working on it. And as soon as they finish it, we will be able to push, push your workouts up to Zwift. Um, that's a feature I am very much looking forward to because I'd enjoy that a lot. And, uh, yeah, we hope to have that for you, uh, as soon as possible, especially with the, uh, Zwift season around the corner. What else is happening in the app? We, it's handy. You've got such a deep Rolodex, just, you know, just name, you you didn't name drop, but I'm going to name drop for you. Like, yeah, Eric Min, Zwift CEO just happens to be in Frank's phone so you can ping him. API is application programming interface. It's how the apps talk to each other. (laughs) Yeah. uh, 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 I don't want to say small, but a a vital detail in making all these things work together. We are, as cyclists in 2023, we are spoiled rotten in how well so many of our toys play together. Mm -hmm. But that takes a lot of work to get them to that point when you finish your bike ride and you just hit stop on your computer and all of a sudden, bing, bong, bing, bong. It's, yeah. it's off to Strava. It's off to optimize. Mm-hmm. That's pretty incredible. And that's thanks to a lot of hard work. And the API is the link of how these apps talk to each other. And I'm surprised that Wahoo doesn't have one, a, uh, a public one. That's why I learned. I was surprised too <laughs> when I learned that. Uh, so I reached out to John Trainer. Thank you very much for replying to my email and sharing us with your update. And uh, yeah, now we're in touch and we look forward to uh, 
uh, bringing that feature to all the Wahoo users, the Wahooligans <laughs> out there. And uh, yeah, you know, um, you know, building a building a piece of software definitely takes uh, some network. And uh, yeah, talk to Eric, talk to the new CEO Kurt, and we have friends over at Zwift, so it's helpful there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, it's a it's a wonderful uh, ecosystem. So. Um, yeah, the app is improving. Uh, we're working on it. We, you know, got some other, uh, fun features. I don't want to mention them yet. Cause I don't want to, I, it takes time and we're, we're, uh, we're working on them as fast as possible. But if I said something, then you would be bummed. You, you didn't have you it yet. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, uh, when you're on a trip with your parents as a young kid and you say, are we there yet? <laughs> many, many times. Yeah, it might it might be like that. So so anyway, um, yeah, we are working every day on it. That's like the other thing I think I want to uh, impress upon everyone. Um, most software is it's not like you do a website and it's like done. Software is like something you just constantly work on. And there are some pieces of software that are pretty much done. They're just maintaining. But we're like actually like building out the vision here. And yeah, so we got a long way to go. And we thank everyone that's been on the journey thus far and for sticking with us and being patient. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just sort of like the training plans came about through a lot of back and forth. Much of it is the experience and wisdom of Frank and the other coaches, but some of the, a lot of the fine tuning has been how that is received by the athletes who use the plans day in and day out. You know, that, that sort of feedback goes into the refining of the plans that other athletes use. And it's the same thing with optimizing. That's something that we've very much enjoyed is hearing from you folks, as far as what you like, what's bugging you, what you'd like to see, you know, what you like about other softwares, other apps, you know, that all goes into the pot. And as Frank says, we can't make everything happen right now. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> but, wish we could. But it yeah. is, it is, uh, it's, yeah, it's been a community thing. So we're not just pulling this together with, in a, in a vacuum. Yeah, your your input has influenced what we're doing and will continue to do so. So, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Keep it coming. And and similar with the, the podcast, we appreciate your feedback in terms of what you want to hear about, questions you have. And on that, I've got a couple announcements. You know, one mm-hmm. is Ask a Fast Cat number twenty five is coming up. Not next pod, but the uh, the one after that. So we're going to focus these questions on this eight week, or I'm sorry. Yeah, it's eight week, eight podcast, how to series. We want to hear your questions about what you have, uh, your questions you have for us about what we've been talking about, the type of training and the seasonal training, how that relates to you. Give a holler. So email, you know, just all the typical forms of communication, bat signal, Instagram, email, chat box in the upper right of optimize <laughs> chat box. And yeah. Yeah. Where there are live coaches there to take your questions and in, including uh, questions for the fast cat, ask a fast cat podcast. So yeah, get those in. Yeah. We'll be talking about that for the next, you know, week and change because that podcast is two weeks out. Mm-hmm. And I will interrupt Ben because the cat is meowing. Um, Cat's got, Simba has questions. Simba has questions. Um, I think <laughs> we mentioned we are, we need your help, listeners. We need more reviews and kind of like what Ben is saying, each review uh, has uh, feedback that we will take we'll, to make our podcast better and to uh, answer your questions. So we need reviews. Please leave them on iTunes, uh, send them in to uh, the app store. You can also leave a review on the particular training plan that you did. If you hit the five stars on our website, you can leave a review of let us know how much faster you got. Um, it all helps. And we'll, maybe we'll read your uh, review, um, live on the air. Yeah. We had more than a thousand five-star reviews Mm -hmm. when we were selling individual training plans. And that was certainly a point of pride still, you know, still is a point of pride for us. And for a time we were drowning in these reviews, which was awesome. And now that we've switched over to optimize, we don't have quite as many and we love reading our reviews of the week and on every podcast. So that's a just selfishly just (laughs) putting the cards (laughs) on the table. That's that we just love to keep that going and, and, uh, give you guys shout out. So that was my second announcement. Yes. You got it. All right. Well, third announcement is we are giving away a Ventum bike. Boom. 
Yes. Uh, so uh, everyone needs to go over to VentumRacing.com. They're one of our partners. You can see that in the partners discount uh, page of the Optimize app. Uh, make sure you just register for their email list, and they are going to be sending out an email with an offer to win a Ventum bike. So the nuts and bolts of that is if you subscribe to the annual Optimize subscription, you'll be entered to win. And it's the new GS1 SRAM Apex bike. It's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, we'll pick a winner and uh, we'll be shipping out the bike mid-October. So just just let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. You sign up for a year of Optimize. Yes. Which you want to do anyhow. Mm -hmm. Unlimited training plans, access to fast cat coaches, et cetera, et cetera. Feedback from Simba the cat here on the podcast. <laughs> and in doing so, you get the chance to win a complete SRAM access bike. That's correct. Okay. That yeah. seems like a pretty good deal. The GS1. Yeah. In mint color. Yeah. Mint. Mint. <laughs> it's like, think of the chocolate chip Oreo ice cream color. I think. Okay. And now I'm going to be distracted the rest of the podcast. You're going to need to go Thank get you. one. Yeah. yeah. Sweet cow, here I come. Yes. You know, I, you know, you're talking about taking things down a rabbit hole. I'm going down one now. One of my favorite training columns I wrote at Velenews back in the day was about the, the muscular benefits, muscular post-workout benefits of having a chocolate milkshake. It was right at the time where the Velenews offices were about mm, 200 yards from a Wendy's, <laughs> you know, which frosty, fi frost, yes. Yeah. And now that was something I wanted to do anyhow, just because of just pure desire. But turns out a bunch of academics had done a lot of research. And I was like on a basketball team or something, and they were doing you know sprint workouts, and the control group just had water after their workouts, and then didn't eat for like an hour. Mm -hmm. And then another group had chocolate ice cream immediately after and their sprint times improved. So I was like, that's all I, that's all the science I need to know. That's, that's it go, right there. Go, yeah. Go yeah. do your work and then get a frosty and you'll get faster protein and carbs, or, or at least you'll be <laughs> pleased that you've got, <laughs> but yeah, you get, yeah, protein in the system. And then the carbs help to speed the protein to the muscles. Mm -hmm. Science, man. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with it. Also during that 30 minute glycogen window. Yes. Yeah, get it in. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's my contribution to this podcast. Thanks, I'm out. <laughs> you heard it here. But I guess you got to do something before you do the do the frosty. You've got to do the work. So let's let's talk about let us talk about the work and let's set the table as far as you know the why lift weights. Yes, this is something that we've a question that's been asked and answered many times. But I think that's always a good place to start. You know, some of my friends will heckle me like Delaney. The last thing you need to do is lift weights. Like you're too chonky mm -hmm. as is mm -hmm. you're going to have a hard time on the hills you need to be getting skinnier mm -hmm. so let's let me rephrase that question from a very selfish myopic perspective of like yeah i weigh 185 pounds why should i be lifting weights if i want to go faster on a bike where watts per kilo is a thing yeah uh, generally um we get this a lot a lot of athletes are like oh, i gain weight when i uh lift weights and it's like yeah that's muscle mass that increases your power output. And if you do the math on your power to weight ratio, generally it's going to increase. So yeah, you might increase your body weight, but you're increasing your power output so that your power to weight ratio is increased in a favorable fashion. So you may gain, I always have athletes take a tape measure, put it around their quad, measure the circumference of your leg before and after the resistance training program and if it increases you can you know generally assume that's muscle mass and it's not like we're having you do bench presses or bicep curls lat rows it, actually to the contrary we're only having you do uh um, cycling specific muscle groups so uh you're doing everything lower body uh squats leg press leg curl so it hits all the major muscle groups that you use in uh, producing power on the bike and nothing but. So it's the T-Rex, you know, we want you to be like T-Rex, you know, <laughs> skinny up top and, you know, big and muscular down below. And uh, that's, that's what we call weightlifting for cycling. So if you want to um, 
you know, I, we get this a lot with uh, men. They're like, yeah, but I want to look good for the wife and girls for the girls. Is yeah. My buddy would say, yes. you, you could do that, but that's not part of our program. <laughs> <laughs> that's you, yeah. You have to do that on your own special, special program. And I honestly, we also have you do yoga. We also have you do, um, a lot of, uh, strength and conditioning. And I mean, if you just go to Instagram, there's plenty of, uh, shredded folks over there from doing yoga. Um, it, I don't know. It's like, if you want to, if you want to get ripped, you can do, do get ripped on yoga is <laughs> how I, I try to rationalize it. But, um, what we're mostly talking about is, uh, we're not like lifting weights to, to get huge or anything. It's purely to increase your, your power output on the bike. Do you have it? Have any studies been done, or do you have any anecdotal info? If like you know, people want to see like the FTP number go up or the sprint number go up, are there any numbers that you can point to aside from just best practices of you know years of experience of what works and what doesn't? Yeah, people asking like, yeah. So what what am I going to get out of this? Like, okay, mm-hmm. so my yeah, my legs, you know, half an inch wider in circumference now, but mm-hmm. what's my Wahoo element. What's my Garmin mm-hmm. edge? What's my Hammerhead Crew Two going to tell me? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'll give you my own personal antidote. I started doing this program in 1998 when I was a Cat Four Sport Class mountain biker. I did it uh, in the off season, and I won uh, the first race. I entered the next season, Cat Three, won the Boulder Roubaix, so um, got my Cat Two upgrade, and I did the weight program the next year and got my Cat One upgrade. And I did, kept doing the same weight program every year in the off season. So I went from cat four to professional level racer in seven years doing the weight program every winter. Same thing. It's just good old fashioned hard work. And just cause you've done it one year doesn't mean you're not going to benefit the next year. And the next year we have athletes just do, this is what you do in the off season year off season after off season after off season. If you want to get better and follow a progression like that, it doesn't have to be going from cat four to professional level. It could be, going from your first Fondo to, you know, smashing your buddies on the group ride in a span of three or four years. It could be, I was just talking to a a non-cycling friend of mine. They're like, yeah, I just got back from the gym. I'm doing this true transformation program. And I was like, tell me about it. And he was explaining everything. It's a combination of like nutrition and weightlifting. It's like, yeah, we have our cyclists do that all the time too. It's just not named true transformation. <laughs> it's it's say, named get faster on the bike. There program. we go. Rawr, rawr, rawr. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. True transformation. That sounds a little yeah. booey as my wife would say. To, to finish your, your, the second part of your question, Ben, um, one of my favorite, uh, like I have a, like, uh, one of my favorite researchers is a fellow by the name of Inigo Mujica. And, um, he wrote a great paper uh, called Optimizing Strength Training for Running and Cycling Endurance Performance. It was a review paper in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports, 2014, August 24 issue, pages 603 to 612, if you want to look it up. Um, great article. He basically just showed how power output increases uh, from lifting weights. It's also, there's a lot of benefits. We could do a whole new podcast about the physiological adaptations from lifting weights. We can talk about mitochondrial density. Scientists have shown that when you lift weights, it it has the same physiological adaptations as riding base. So like a lot of zone two. Um, the other physiological adaptations are it increases bone density. For masters cyclists, we kind of mentioned this earlier. We're fighting that age-related decline, and we're losing muscle mass. But if you lift weights, you can not only keep that muscle mass, but you can probably increase it. And that's how you fight father time as a as a cyclist. So it definitely behooves a master cyclists anywhere from. But it, it, it the benefits are not age specific. I mean, we have juniors lifting weights all the way up to grandmasters 65 plus Mm -hmm. everyone can benefit from from lifting weights i think one of my philosophies is get in there lift weights get the adaptations in your body i could hear the cat we might have to pause here (laughs) for me to uh um, put him downstairs but uh, i have a main coon cat everyone listeners if anyone has a main coon cat out there they are these big fluffy lynx like cats and they are very audible. They, they, <laughs> they, they describe the breed as a, uh, 
a dog trapped in a cat's body. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah. he he will greet you at the door. Yeah. He'll follow you around the house. And he will meow at you when uh, the door is closed in between you and him. <laughs> you've, you've heard about chatty Cathy's. This is a chatty Cathy. Yeah. Uh, the last time I was uh, you know, here recording a podcast, I had my backpack open. And within like 34 mm. seconds, Simba had just, like, made a nest inside the backpack. It was quite, quite cozy. Yeah. Frank pulls Simba out. And Simba's like a good four feet tall when fully stretched out, which was pretty impressive. They could get a yep. beast that large into a backpack. So, yeah. He's a big one. Yeah. I, I want to complete my thought there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, the, the physiological adaptations from lifting weights are immense. Um, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole with this podcast other than to impress upon you. Um, if you do want to improve your uh, performance on the bike and you have the time, uh, lift weights, um, and then, you know, what comes up in the Ask a Fast Cats, nearly every episode is, you know, do you believe in lifting weights year round? And the answer is uh, yes, but no, it depends. <laughs> and uh, what we do believe in is this 10 week uh, weightlifting program. And then after that, your time is best spent riding your bike. So you, you, you stop lifting your weights, you shift, you move on and it's just period, periodized training. So you, this is the phase you'll do for 10 weeks and then you move on to doing your base phase for a period of time after that. And then this is where it gets a little different. People ask, or do you believe in strength training once year round? And it's a different type of strength training. So it's, you wouldn't want to lift heavy squats year round. So, but we're going to lift heavy now, lift the heavy shit to quote Dr. Stacy Sims. And then once you get into the season, you may do a lot of functional movements, maybe some kettlebell swings, some Viper, Viper swings, some movements that don't, um, uh, introduce fatigue to your muscles that would, uh, yeah, you know, just cause you to have low power output and, and extra fatigue on the bike. I like the, the wintertime lifting for a few reasons. One, it, it, it's focused time. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm sure I would get bored of going to the gym year round and that's just not feasible. And when it's warm and sunny, I'd much rather be riding my bike outside. That's right. But yeah, in the wintertime, yeah, it's like, do you want to go ride in the dark and cold and ice? No, maybe not so much, but like having a plan to follow, just get, mm-hmm. get in the gym, get in routine, go knock it out. And um, yeah, it's a, it goes by pretty quickly. And then, yeah, you come out ra- raring to go. And and plus, like yeah. doing doing the lifting the heavy shit, as Stacy would say, takes a toll. And you don't want to be doing that when you're trying to be fast on the bike because you're, yeah, if, if you're doing it properly, uh, you're not riding at you know, your best level ever. So mm-hmm. yeah, have it, doing it in the wintertime. Good. Does a body, <laughs> does a body good. Yes. I like it. Uh, I like lifting weights. Uh, number hands down. Number one is it just makes you faster. Uh, so I'm all about, uh, improvement. Um, you know, riding, what is the Zwift slogan? Uh, faster is funner. So there's that. Um, I, you know, it's very diverse training. It gets you off the bike and you don't have to battle weather. You can lift at night. You can lift in the morning. It's very, uh, it's just a different style of training. You know, it's like all bike all year round makes Jack a dull boy. And, uh, yeah, um, there's that. And plus you can only ride this smart trainer so much. And, uh, the, the, the lifting weights, you know, prevent, you know, saves you 10 weeks of, if you're down in your basement, I mean, you'll still ride the bike during this phase. It does include a lot of bike workouts. Um, you can get an hour of aerobic training a day. If you warm up in zone two before and after you lift, which we'll describe here in a, in a little bit, that's good quality aerobic endurance training coupled with the physiological benefits from lifting the weights. It's, it's a win-win and, uh, yeah. So now we've tackled the why before we tackle the how. Why don't we take a quick break here? Frank's <laughs> going to go do some weightlifting and lift some of the put cat. Put the cat away. Yeah. And we'll be back in a jiffy to talk the how and the specifics of weightlifting for cycling. Yes. This podcast and our weekly training tip email focus on translating the science and the art of endurance training without paid ads. To do this, our work is made entirely possible from our listeners. That's you. Subscribing to our new training platform, Optimize, or hiring a one-on-one fast cat coach. In return, we give in-app coaching support to your questions plus partner discounts from Castelli, Whoop, Hammerhead, and Ventum, along with the best training plans in the world 
in our brand new training to recovery data visualization that combines your activity and your wearable data. If you want to take your training to the next level, it is our goal to ensure we give you more value than the price of an optimized subscription. To learn more about the benefits of Optimize or to review our coaches' bios, head over to fastcatcoaching.com. Use the 25% discount code 25podcast to see for yourself. Combining endurance training with explosive and heavy strength training will improve endurance performance due to the delayed activation of less efficient type 2 fibers, improved neuromuscular efficiency, conversion of fast twitch type 2 X fibers into more fatigue resistance type 2 A fibers. Is that enough science for you folks? <laughs> that is from Dr. Mujica's paper in Scandinavian Journal of Medical Science from 2014. This is like one of the many pieces of uh, academic research that goes into the why of lifting for cycling. And if you want to read more on that, you can certainly head on over to fastcatcoaching.com to dig into the science. But now we're just going to talk about the how you should be going about this. You know, the, the actual act of lifting, starting with the first of four phases, the way we break it down here. We've got adaptation, adaptation, <laughs> adaptation, <laughs> hypertrophy, which I called hypertrophy for the longest time when I was buying fast cat plans and I was just looking at my printout. I thought it was hypertrophy, but that's not how you say this. <laughs> that's the tomato, the, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> that's the second phase. Strength is the third phase and then power. So Frank, what are these four phases? Uh, from a 30,000 foot view and then we'll dive into how you can do each. Yeah. 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 Uh, real quick. I want to, um, uh, just preface the, these four phases. So we have you do the same three exercises for all four phases. One of the tenets of weightlifting, uh, as a coach is simplicity. It's the kiss principle. Keep it simple, silly. And, uh, so what we do during the adaptation phase is teach you how to do the lift. So it's squat, leg press, leg curl. The squat is really the most technical lift of them all because it. we do recommend a free squat. If you want to use the Smith machine, maybe this is your first year lifting. The Smith machine is nice because it's very beginner friendly because you can't screw it up. It is locked into um, a machine. It goes up and down in a vertical plane with no lateral movement. So it's very safe. Uh, and it's I used the Smith machine when I started off squatting, and then I graduated over to the, the free squat once I became more proficient with my squat form. So squat form is very, very important. But once you get over to the leg press, it's the the machine goes up and down the way the machine goes up and down and again you cannot mess it up it's just just put your feet on the platform put the weight on there lower it down and just do it and um there's you can't screw it up so it's, i really like that as a coach because it's a, a basically an injury free uh lift and then finally the leg curl the leg curl it's a single joint movement and we really preach um, multi-joint uh, specific exercises. So the squat and the leg press, you know, you bend your your ankles, your knees, and your your hips. So multi-joint, that's what we mean. All those muscle groups that are involved in, in pedaling a pedal stroke. The leg curl is just your knees. But what's nice is uh, for those of us who tend to be mashers, the leg curl is it just isolates your hamstrings and helps hopefully uh, helps you strengthen your hamstrings to get those involved in the pedal stroke the, or the power production of of the pedal stroke. So very simple three exercises we have you do those for the life of the uh, the program. And getting back to to Ben's what what are the what's the thirty thousand foot view of the the four phases? It's this. The adaptation phase is three weeks. That's to acclimate your legs to the weight room to teach you how to do the lifts and to uh, prepare you to lift heavy. It takes three weeks. It's it's, it's fun. <laughs> uh, the, the hypertrophy phase, two weeks. The number one goal of the hypertrophy phase is to put on new muscle, to build muscle. The strength phase, also two weeks. 
That is to train that new muscle you just put on to produce great force. And the power phase, the final phase, it's to train that new muscle that's now capable of producing great force to do so at cycling specific speeds. The power phase is what makes our resistance training program cycling specific. It's in that speed specific work. So if you think about the cadence of when you pedal a bike, most of us pedal between 70 and 90, maybe 100 RPMs. Now think if you think of your squat cadence. Your squat cadence is like three or four per minute. So it, actually the way the body works physiologically, um, strength is speed specific. So just doing a squat slowly uh, is actually not as good for you as, as doing it very fast. So um, in the power phase, we do have you lift fast. So very lightweight, very rapid, explosive, acceleratory movements that not only get into speed specificity, they also happen to help you with your acceleration and sprinting. So it's a uh, multi, multi beneficial, but anyway, the, the power phase really kind of brings home the hypertrophy and the strength phases. It's the money phase as I call it. And we have you do what's called jump squats. Ben has done them. Oh yeah. Many times, much to the, the bewilderment and <clears throat> consternation of the good folks at, uh, South Boulder recreation center. Like, Son, <laughs> what are you doing over there? You're doing it wrong. It's, yeah. it's not a movement, uh, often seen in gyms. <laughs> yeah. We'll get, we'll get more into that, but yeah, just, yeah. Picture, yeah. Picture a cyclist jumping up and down in a weight room with a, a bar with some lighter weights on. Yeah. For the time being, we'll come back to that adaptation. Yeah. Just take it back to the start. You know, sort of like last uh, podcast, we were talking about fall activities and how running, you know, fall cross training activity, I should say, and how running is a popular one for, for some cyclists to give you a mental break. It keeps the aerobic engine going, you know, also you know, can strengthen some neglected muscles or muscles that are neglected for cyclists and get the, you know, some of the uh, connective tissues and stabilizers and all that going. And, um, however, th- th- we are, many of us are, um, walking warnings as to what happens <laughs> when you do too much too fast mm-hmm. and that you can take off running as a cyclist with a great aerobic engine and keep going pretty well for like the first day. Yeah. And then you will be unable to walk for some time. Similar thing at, at play here with weights. You can go in there and especially with your legs, you've got strong legs Yeah, and you can, you probably lift a lot of weight right off the bat and probably do a bunch of reps mm-hmm. first day. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. And then this is why one of the reasons why I, you know, bought and used the weightlifting plan for years it was kind of the same reason I bought plans like for triathlon when I'm like, I, I know I need guidance here. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I could, yeah. you know, take Joe Friel's book out and map it all out and, and maybe get close but it would be a lot easier if I just had a plan and a formula to follow. And, mm-hmm. and with that basic plan now been elevated quite a bit, it continues on in the Optimize app where you plug in your data and the app will tell you how much to do and when. So you're not having to guess, like, am I doing too much? Like, am I going to be having a hard time walking for a while? Or like, am I doing too little? Like, you just, you just have to FTFP, follow the <laughs> weightlifting plan. Yeah, whenever I have athletes that are new to the weightlifting, <clears throat> I always check in on them after the first week of the adaptation phase, and I ask them if they're sore. And uh, the ones that say they're really, really sore, they uh, they they started putting too much weight on the bar too soon. Um, and the the right way to do it is to um, two podcasts ago we mentioned the broom, uh, but yeah. Take a broom handle and you can just do body squats. And um, that's that's how you start off. And then you the next time you go back to the gym, you start off with no weight on the bar. The bar happens to weigh 45 pounds. Um, but check your ego because um, when done properly, even that will make you a little bit sore. Mm-hmm. And then we're really <clears throat> just going to have you put on um, five pounds per set each time you, you go and lift. And over the court, you're going to do nine, you're going to do three weeks of adaptation, three workouts per week. So nine workouts total. By the time you get to the workouts, number eight and nine, you're lifting a, a, a decent amount enough to challenge yourself. 
but the workouts two and three are f- really light and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a progression to give your body and your muscles time to to catch up with uh, how strong your legs are and uh, yeah it just takes patience and um, that's what that's what Ben's talking about so again that's the first of four phases that's the adaptation phase mm-hmm. in our 10 week plan which is included in optimize and that is three weeks. So yeah, again, you could put this all together yourself, but just it's easier to follow the plan. That's why I keep banging on about optimizing the plans are in there, man. Mm-hmm. Second phase, hypertrophy, mm-hmm. putting on new muscle. Uh, in our 10 weeks, how many weeks is hypertrophy? Two weeks, uh, four times per week. And so two days on, one day off, two days on. Repeat that again uh, the following week. So, you know... Um, The primary goal, as we said during this training phase, is to build muscle. And this is where you can, uh, this is where, you you know, you'll put on some some muscle weight. Um, In terms of uh, sets and reps, you're going, so in the adaptation phase, you did Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times per per week. You did four sets, eight to 12 reps per per set. Once you get into the hypertrophy phase, what is uh, a, a hallmark of the program is we have you set your one RM. That's your one resistance maximum. And it's kind of like a, like a, the equivalent of a field test for your weightlifting. You basically, after three weeks of adaptation, you got a pretty good feel of what you can squat and leg press and leg curl. So you just say, okay, what's the, what, what do I think I can lift once, just once, not twice. And it's a challenge. So, you know, um, if you're doing, there's like online calculators that could get you in your ballpark and we have one on our, on our website, but really if you've been doing four sets of like 150 pounds, eight reps per set, you can maybe say, oh, you know, I could do two, let's just say 225 once. So you put 225 on, you try to do it once you barely do it. And it's like, okay, call it, call that good. That's your one RM. It's just a number to get you in the ballpark. You're going to enter that number. And then our, our, our formulation of the hypertrophy strength and power phase uses that 1RM to calculate how much you should lift um, for each set of each phase. Very much like your zone-based training has you do 76 to 90% of your threshold for your tempo and 84 to 97% uh, for sweet spot, so forth. And so that's what the, the 1RM does. It's like zone-based weightlifting essentially. And during the hypertrophy phase, you're lifting between 65 and 75% of your one RM. Doesn't sound like that much, but we'll have you do six sets and we'll have you do eight to 12 reps per set. So, uh, yeah, you'll be doing like 60 squats on Monday, 60 more squats on Tuesday, 60 more squats on Thursday, 60 more squats on Friday. I tell my athletes, if you don't hate me by Thursday, you're not doing it right. (laughs) And uh, if you're not sore, uh, generally, from my personal experience, by the time I get to the fifth set, I'm already sore. Like you're you're lowering the weight down. You're like, holy gosh, (laughs) holy cats, I'm already sore. You got one more set to do. You got to lift the next day. This is where, uh, you know, you kind of find out who you are and what uh, what you're willing to do to accomplish your goals. Yeah. It's sort of like Tabitha, isn't it? Like you look at it on paper, you're like, that's it. That's just, you know, 12 minutes of work total. How hard can it be? And then yeah. you're like six minutes in, like, I don't know if I can do seven minutes. Much of the time. <laughs> yeah. What do you recommend people doing in between sets? You know, we say take, you know, mm-hmm. two minutes rest. Does that mean you just, you know, if you're doing on the machine, you just sit there and hog the machine and space out or like, I'll just like we'll kind of walk around the gym yeah. and kick my legs and, yeah. Cue up the next podcast. Do you have, do you Go have get any a drink like of water? Special, is there any like magic or is it like you just taking a short break and then get back to it? For the most part. Yeah. I mean, if there's no one waiting on the squat rack, I'll I just, you know, you can sit there and hog it. But if it's, if it's a busy gym, you may need to take your weight off and let someone else have a, have a, have a rep or two. Um, man, yeah, you know, I've, these days long ago, I'd go walk and get, you know, drink a water, maybe shoot the shit with someone. Uh, nowadays you generally tend to look at your phone, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, shoot a message back or, you know, check your Instagram. Um, but yeah, Jeff, I sit down. I mean, it's, it, it, you just need, you know, I've tried doing core in between, just save that for in between exercises. Um, 
So as yeah. long as it's not like intervals on the bike where sometimes no. you'll specify, okay, you know, the, the primary work load is this. And then when you bring it down, you're bringing it down to tempo or something. You're not just coasting. You're still doing work. Mm-hmm. Here, it's it's pretty straightforward. Like you lift the heavy weight. Yeah. You put it down, you take a break, and then you come back and you lift the heavy yeah. weight. That's all you got to do. You pick things up and you put them <laughs> down. Yeah. I mean, and if you're getting tired and you feel like you need more than two minutes, take it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the jam there. Um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's how you do it. And then the other thing is, you know, so you just did 60 squats. Guess what you're doing after those 60 squats, you're going to do 60 leg presses. So in between the squat and the leg press, I actually, it's nice to do a little core work, maybe some sit-ups, some back extensions. You can do some medicine ball crunches. You can do some, you know, lateral lunges, side planks, planks, you know, things like that. I generally like to take five minutes in between doing the squats and the, the leg press. But if I'm in a hurry or if you're time crunch, you can just go right, right, right over there. Here's a question. I maybe have been doing it wrong for years. Often I will you know, rotate between all three things. Mm-hmm. Uh, like do a set of one, do a, another set of the other thing, mm-hmm. set of the third thing, and then come back to the first. Does that, do your, do your legs care? I really don't think so. To be honest, I think, uh, you're getting in the work is what's yeah. most important. I think the people that may be waiting to use the squat rack may care. <laughs> it is, you know, it just, yeah. again, it depends on if the gym is crowded or not, or maybe you got a squat rack at home or you're doing the, the at home program and then you can do whatever you want. That wouldn't apply if you're, I don't think anyone's got the leg press at home. I know one athlete that does. Wow. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. If you're at the gym, I mean, I like to just because uh, because you're you're putting um, like you got like the big plate on and you got the little plate to get it the exact weight that you got on the spreadsheet. I like to just go through the all the squats, complete all my squats, um, unrack the the weight, move on to the leg press, do all my leg presses, unrack the weight, and then go over to the leg press. But if you you want to rotate between them all three, yeah, have at it. Yeah, at the end of the day. It's the same amount of work. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. So that's hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. Is there uh, anything else we need to dig into there before we move on to yeah. strength? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two things. Um, delayed onset muscle soreness, the DOMS. Um, as I was joking, um, kidding, not kidding. If you're not sore during this phase, you probably aren't challenging yourself. Um, there's two things that will help with that. Uh, you know, Epsom salt bath in the evening will help with that. But um, we talk about warm up and cool down. Um, in an ideal world, you're able to do zone two for 30 minutes before and after you do your lifting. And, um, you know, a hypertrophy workout could take a couple hours. If uh, you did zone two for 30 minutes, it's going to take about an hour to go through all the lifts and then, you know, 30 more minutes. So it's a, it's a long workout. If you don't have two hours, you can cut the zone two, don't cut any of the, the weightlifting. So if you only have 15 minutes before and after, do it. And then strategies of where you do it, like, uh, <laughs> so it, you're warming up. So don't do zone two at home and then drive 40 minutes to the gym and then lift. Cause by the time you get to the gym, now you need to warm up again. The do, you can do the zone two at home if uh, you live near your gym, you can walk to your gym. If you can ride your bike to the gym, you can ride. If you have a 30 minute nice walk to the gym, or uh, sorry, I meant ride. Riding to the gym is wonderful. Oftentimes that doesn't work in the dead of winter, cold, snow and ice, so forth. And then um, honestly, uh, riding the triangle bike at the gym is just the same, in my opinion. You're just doing the work. And sure, yeah, you're not going to, you know, get your Zwift level up points, but uh you're doing the work. And if you really uh, you know, want to quantify everything, which I'm a big fan of, bring your bike computer with you to the gym, bring your heart rate monitor and record your heart rate and you can upload that and you can get an OTS from that, you'll get the file, you'll 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 get credit for the 30 minutes and that time will add up over the course of the next 10 weeks. So that's the lifting that's the soreness, that's the time constraints, and that's the, the flexibility of how to, how to get it all in. Strength phase. So once you put on a few pounds of power-producing leg muscle from the hypertrophy phase, now it's time to train this muscle to produce more forceful contractions. 
And without going into a physiological lecture on the nervous system simulation, that's the goal of this phase of your resistance training, to teach your brain how to innervate uh, the musculature which you just built during the hypertrophy phase. So to, in order to do this, we uh, lift fewer sets, less reps, and heavier weight. You may talk to some of your bros, and they're talking about heavy, heavy, uh, heavy, short, or short, what are they, just less reps, heavy weight. And then in the strength phase, it's less reps, more weight. And uh, that's what you're doing. So whereas you did 60 squats in the uh, hypertrophy phase, now you're going to go down to, oh, let me count up in the sets, 24 uh, at heavy weight. You're going to be lifting between 70 and 100% of your 1RM. That's the heavy. So remember in the hypertrophy phase, you were 55 to 65%. Now you're 70 to 100%, but low, low reps. So four sets, six reps per set in the first week. And then in the second week, we have you lift even heavier and go down to like six, four, two, one rep per, per set of the 1RM. And what is significant of the strength phase is so you produce great force, we drop the number of uh, sets and reps, and then this type of training produces great, sh like a lot of stress on your musculature, and uh, it takes a lot of recovery. And so we only lift strength phase twice a week, and we go back to lifting on Mondays and Thursdays, for example, and then you're going to do some neuromuscular sprint work on Tuesdays and Friday, and you take Wednesday off, and you're riding easy on the weekend. So... Um, yeah, two-week force phase, four to five workouts before moving on to your final power phase. And so, as I mentioned, in the strength phase, we start to uh, couple the neuromuscular sprint intervals to the gym work. So you lift one day, and then you sprint the next day, take a rest day, repeat. Um, if you're on the perf like an advanced or pro level plan, you may lift in the morning and sprint in the afternoon, and then ride long endurance the, the next day, then take a break. Uh, but for us mere mortals that, you know, only have an hour a day, <laughs> yeah, it, your strength workout, the time that it takes to do the strength workout is greatly reduced from the hypertrophy. The hypertrophy is the most time intensive phase. The strength phase, you can probably knock out in honestly 20 minutes if you're hustling. Four sets, six reps per set, you get it done. Go into the gym, put the put the weight on the rack, do the work, get out of there. If you're warm, you still, if you can, if you have time, you still want to warm up 30 minutes zone two before and after, whether that's at home at the gym on the triangle bike, maybe they have cool spin bikes. It, it doesn't really matter. Just bring your heart rate up into, uh, you know, 56 to 75% of your threshold heart rate, hold it there and call it good move on. And um, yeah, that's the that's the uh, strength phase. One element that we do add uh, during the strength phase, we start to increase the amount of time you spend on your bike on the weekend because you're done with the hypertrophy phase. That's the most difficult. Uh, the strength phase isn't as difficult. The muscle soreness should subside. And yeah, you start riding base on Saturdays and Sundays. This is the LSD portion of your phase, long, slow distance. So if you were doing hour and a half, two hour rides on Saturdays, we're going to have you do two, two and a half, maybe working up to three to four. You know, you uh, you may be up to a four or five hour ride by the time the holidays roll around, uh, weather permitting. And uh, yeah, it's good, good base work before mm -hmm. you move on to the sweet spot part base. Phase four, power. It's yep. a power. <laughs> this is the funny one. Yeah. But it, the effective one. This is the jump squat phase. So, uh, you know, you're not Michael Jordan out there, uh, but you are lifting in such a way that your toes come off the ground. So uh, verbally, the instructions are lower the squat down uh, to the normal. We didn't talk about squat depth, but super briefly, no ass to the grass. Uh, only bend your knees no more than you would on the pedal stroke of your bike. Generally, that's femurs parallel to the ground. Use a mirror at the gym just to check. It's, it's, most squat racks are in front of a mirror, and if you're lucky, there's like a side mirror. And like when you're when you do your squat, go down, just take a glance to the right and check your check your squat depth. If your quads are parallel to the ground, that's that's about 
that's fairly specific to the pedal stroke of a bike. So without, sorry for the rabbit hole, but anyway, uh, power phase, lower the squat down. You now you're lifting, uh, lightweight, light reps, but very fast, uh, explosive movement. So now you're down to 45% of your one RM. It feels like a feather after the strength phase. This is like where you start to feel really strong from, from lifting. So put on 45% feels featherweight. You lower that weight down and then you lift it up so fast, so explosively with such acceleration, your upward momentum takes you off the ground. That's the jump squat. And, uh, when you land, you know, be extra careful if you're doing the free squat, if you're on the Smith machine, this is why the Smith machine is more safe. If you're a beginner, if you're first year jump squatting this, you can't mess it up on the Smith machine. It just stays locked in. You can't you know, hurt yourself. The free squat, you know, you got to pay attention to your balance. You can't just go nuts. Uh, and if you're the type of person who skips putting the clips on the bar, Oh yeah. Which you should not do. You should always put the clips on the bar. Definitely. You want to do it here. You don't want to be that guy or gal mm -hmm. throwing weights around, tipping over <laughs> while doing this. If you do not put the clips on and the weight slides off, guess what happens to the other <laughs> side? <laughs> I've, I've never had that happen, but, uh, I've always put the clips on just word of <laughs> caution. Um, yeah. So, so you're, now you're jump squatting. And then when you land, here's how, what I, uh, articulate to athletes. So when you land, you land and then you're not qu your foot pattern is not where it started. So just take a second or two to readjust putting your feet back in the position at which they started with, take a deep breath, lower it back down again, nice and slow pause, just momentarily and then just explode upward and you're going to do uh four sets six sets per oh, sorry six reps per set again it doesn't take you too much time um you might could get it in and out of the gym in, in 20 to, to 30 minutes and uh it's also twice a week mondays and thursdays typically and then you do standing start intervals that are coupled with your uh with your power phase and the standing start intervals as we talked about two podcasts ago um it's a one to six work to rest ratio so it's 15 seconds on 90 seconds off in that workout a lot of people that are super type a or impatient it takes a while with all that rest it's actually kind of annoying but um uh, yeah, take the rest and it's good quality training time. And, and the, what you're doing is that you're taking the strength that you gained in the gym, the power, and you're transferring it out onto the bike. That's what you're doing with your neuromuscular sprint workouts. And then also your standing start. So 15 seconds on, you're going from zero to 120 RPMs in 15 seconds. I like to do those outside if at all possible, but if the weather or darkness or time permits, you may do those, uh, inside just as well. Um, yeah, you just can't feel the wind in your face or accelerate <laughs> quite, quite, quite as much. And, um, yeah, it's actually, you, there's not that much muscle soreness associated with the power phase. This is where you start to feel pretty snappy on the bike. You've been doing all these jump squats. You've been doing the standing starts. You got the strength phase under your belt. You might begin to, you know, feel a little frisky on the group ride <laughs> on Saturday um, generally that's okay. Just don't be the group ride hero. Uh, keep it nice and chill. You generally just are looking to get in some, some miles, a lot of, lot of zone two time, but, um, by and large, that's, that's the power phase for you. So in some, should one lift weights, should one cyclist lift weights? Yes, absolutely. How much? Well, we find 10 weeks to be a good amount. And, and what specifically mm -hmm. should we do each and every day? Well, if you haven't been <laughs> keeping metip meticulous notes, there's a, there's an easy button you can press here, yeah. which is get the optimize app and then plug in this 10 week weightlifting for cycling plan. And then you just FTFP. It's as easy as that. And if you have some questions about, well, when should I do this in regards to my season, my goals next year, ask the fast cat coaches inside the optimize app and they will gladly go through your calendar with you as far as what your goals are and when, and then work backwards through the different potential training plans that are good fit for you that can scale to your available time to train mm -hmm. and then plug this in right where it should be on your calendar. And then you will be off and running off and squatting off and leg pressing off and leg curling your way to building power to be 
faster and fitter next year. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Like my friend that was doing the true transformation program, this is a true cycling transformation for you. Uh, We get a lot of questions. Can I keep lifting the, I mean, you could, but, uh, I generally, if you work this hard in the gym, you're going to want to, uh, put it all together on the bike. And so the phase that comes next after this is the sweet spot base. This is where you do, Um, some of our sweet spot training plans or move on to the 16 weeks of of sweet spot plan. A lot of after the next question that comes is, uh, will I lose what I gained in the weight room? And the answer is no, not, not really what you will gain when you couple all that aerobic endurance training with the weightlifting training is that true transformation, uh, that you'll go through. And what I tell athletes is like, you know, let's, you know, put the gym membership on pause and, and plan on, uh, going back same time, same bat channel next off season. Absolutely. As we mentioned at the top of the show, we've got one more in our eight week how to series coming up. And that's some variations on lifts you can be doing. And then after that, we've got the ask a fast cat number 25, where we're hoping you can chime in with your questions. If we have left some stones unturned in this, fall, winter, early spring, how-to series, hit us up. Email, Instagram, and of course, Inside Optimize. Send us your questions and we will put them into the next podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I think that's it. Yeah. That that would be a wrap. And we've I've said FTFP a number of times in this pod, <laughs> so I'm going to let you say it one final time here, sir. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to use 25 podcasts to save 25% off your first month of the optimized subscription and you can work hard, ride fast, have fun. And as always FTFP.